His church was bombed. He went to Washington and spoke to the president about the need of beefing up his security, and he didn't do it, so the president was assassinated. He prophesied television and radio before there was even thoughts about it. He built a city, but he died thinking he was Elijah. His name is John Alexander Dowie. I'm Robert Slayton, and this is God's Generals. One of the great men that we've not heard much about in the Pentecostal circles is John Alexander Dowie, mainly because his ending days were not as great as his beginning days. In today's broadcast, we're going to discuss the life and the ministry of this phenomenal man who came out of the British Isles. Actually, he was born in Scotland, in the city of Edinburgh. And then they moved to Australia, and he grew up as a little boy and a teenager. And when it's time to go to university, they sent him back to Scotland to get his university training. And when he went to choose his subjects to study, he chose two interesting subjects. He chose political science and theology. And to me, as a historian, I think that's the first sign of his apostolic calling. A man that has a love for God and wants to know about God's word and study theology. And the political side, which speaks of the governmental side of the apostolic anointing that was already in his life. While he was at the school there in Scotland, he also, because he was so intelligent, he was probably one of those students that always asked the question that irritated the teacher, or all the students went, not him again with the question, because he was such of a high level of intelligence uh, in his subjects, they made him an honorary chaplain of the school's medical infirmary. And so he had access to all the medical lectures too. And he noticed that when he would go down to hear the medical lectures and see the operation. Now, in those days, let me explain, when they did the medical teaching, they'd put the student uh, in a round type of auditorium and then put the doctor or the surgeon and the person they're going to operate on in the middle of this round uh, theater where all the students could see and watch the operation happen. Well, Dowie, because he was the honorary chaplain and very smart and very known in the school, was given access to hear the lectures and to see what was happening. So he would see what the doctor would say when the operation was going on. And because he was involved in the infirmary and doing the chaplain service of the infirmary, he was able to see the outcome of it later. He would later form a doctrine that would be a part of the early Pentecostal movement called Don't Trust Your Doctors, Throw Out Your Medicine, and Trust God Only. And that's where this doctrine came from because Dowie looked at medical science as an inexact science. And so from the very beginning of his ministry, he began to see that some of these things in medical science, especially in the 1800s, were not quite as good as just trusting God alone. And so when that began to form in his life, he never really finished college because his family got in trouble financially in Australia, asked him to come back and help. So he left uh, the United Kingdom, went back to Australia, and took his first church. His first church, he didn't like. And so he resigned after being there less than a year. He left them because he said they were lethargic people and did not deserve a pastor like himself. And so he found another congregation where he was uh, welcomed and they were a little more active and wanted to do the gospel a bit more than the last one he was with. And they also encouraged him to finish his schooling, which he did. During this time, uh, there was a plague that came through the outskirts of Sydney, Australia, where he was pastoring. And the plague had killed 40 people in less than two weeks. And so he was doing all the funerals, helping all the families, and even officiating some funerals of other churches because their pastors had died. And he was so distraught by this that he began to pray and ask God, can't Jesus, who walked the seas of Galilee and healed the sick then, can he do something about what's happening in Australia? And so this kind of praying brought to him a revelation. God illuminated to him Acts 10, 38. And that verse says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and in all that were oppressed of the devil. When that verse came alive to him, he realized that sickness was of the devil and that healing was of God. And Jesus came to do good things, which was to heal and destroy the works of the devil. About the time that this revelation came to life in his spirit, there was a knock at the door and it was a child from down the street from one of his uh, church members. The mother had sent the child to get their pastor because the child uh, in the home, the other sibling was dying. And so Dow had just had this revelation of Acts 10, 38. He runs out of the house without his jacket or his coat, and we're going to find out what he did next. 
What you've heard on today's show is only a small fraction of the incredible stories of another one of God's generals. For the complete story, pick up a copy of God's Generals, Volume 1 today. This historical classic contains the compelling spiritual biographies of 12 extraordinary heroes of faith, men and women who were dynamically empowered by the Holy Spirit to ignite the fires of revival worldwide. You will discover how they achieved their amazing successes and how you can become a victorious leader for God. In this volume, you will be captivated by the lives of John Alexander Dowie, Maria Woodworth Eder, Evan Roberts, Charles F. Parham, and William J. Seymour. John G. Lake, Smith Wigglesworth, Amy Semple McPherson, Catherine Coleman, William Branham, Jack Coe, and A.A. A. Allen. Order a copy today or other life-changing books by visiting robertslearden.com. That's robertslearden.com. Or by calling 1-877-888-1500 for U.S. residents or 1-941-748-3883 for viewers outside the U.S. Roberts Learden accurately depicts without bias the good, bad, and the ugly so you can learn from the lives of God's generals. Order your copy today. Dowie was chasing the young child down the street and entered the home. And when he walked into the living room of the house of the child and the church member, the doctor was in there writing out the death certificate for the child in the other room. And the doctor said to Dr. Dowie, I can't be here to sign the time of death on, on the death certificate. I leave that for you to do. I feel in everything else. I need you to put the time. And he showed him in the little document where the death time was to be written in. And Dowie said, I won't do it and got upset and spoke very harshly to the doctor, even to where the doctor thought something was wrong with Dr. Dowie. He walked into the room where the little child was dying and the mother was walking around the bed distraught as you could understand that uh, the emotional strain of knowing that your child was dying and there was no natural hope and you somehow thought the preacher could help you, so you called for your pastor. And he walked into the room and he asked the mother, why did you call for me to come? She said, oh, I thought maybe you could do something. And he said, I can do something. I'm going to pray and ask God to heal your child. This is the first time Dr. Dowie ever made those words and uttered those words come out of his mouth, say, I'm going to pray a healing prayer. He didn't know how to pray a healing prayer. So he goes over to the bed and prays for the child, ends the prayer, and they take a few steps back to see what's going to happen. And nothing happened for the first few moments. And all of a sudden, the child's eyes open. She sat up in the bed and asked for some hot chocolate. And then she wanted some toast. And within an hour, she was up in the room playing, perfectly healed. Dowie went to every church member that was sick, prayed with them, and nobody else in this church died of the plague. And nobody else died in that church except for a few elderly people who he stated was, it was their time to go while he was pastor of that church. Now, this revelation of Acts 10, 38 began the great healing ministry of Dr. Dowie. He believed at that time that nobody else in the world had that revelation but him. Now you say, how could he think that? Well, number one, realize the world of communications was not as developed back then as it is today. All they had was maybe newspapers and telegrams are just being you know, developed. And so they didn't have the world knowledge they had. And so Dow had never heard anybody else preach this but himself. He had never seen any miracles. And so he began to preach what we call the divine healing message from the gospel. And he began to get results. And as his ministry began to grow in Australia, people would come to him in the prayer lines. And he was kind of like Smith Wigglesworth in a way that he ministered to people. He would uh, be very abrupt and, uh, and he would hit gorders and slap knots off people's bodies. And newspaper folks would report seeing them roll on the floor after he had slapped their neck or their face or off their uh, back of them or something. And so this is not just Christian folklore. This is secular presses talking about what they saw in Dowie's meetings. Now, before we get much further in Dowie's life, we have to make a statement and talk about a little season of his life. When Dr. Dowie was at the height of his healing ministry in Australia, he had this uncanny ability to be distracted and to leave the ministry or go from his main calling. He came uh, into a relationship with some people because of the popularity and his, and his fame outside of the church world as well with folks who wanted him to run for a seat in the Australian parliament, in Australian government. And so he quit the ministry to run to become a member of parliament in the Australian government. And so he ran a campaign, and back then prohibition was a big thing. And so Dowie preached against smoking and drinking and living holy and doing these things, and they thought he was going to win, but he lost. Now let me make a statement. When you're in ministry, you're already in office. There are two types of government in the earth. There is the natural government and there is spiritual government. If you are called into ministry, you're in spiritual government. You don't need to leave the spiritual to become one of the natural. 
Many apostolic gifts misread that governmental call thinking that God is calling them to do something in the natural and they make a mistake in misreading it. Dowie made that mistake. His church went down. He went bankrupt. All kinds of bad things happened. He lost. It was a disaster. And so finally he woke up and went back to his call and everything began to come back to him again. So that also tells us if you will correct your mistake and correct your misstep and go back to where you belong, then the blessing of God and the honor of God and the excitement of the people will all come back to you. And so he goes back into ministry after losing this race and going through all the financial troubles and he comes back praying for the sick and his church grows and it begins to increase. It grows into the thousands. So he has a large, what we call mega church today in the 1800s in Australia. Then Dowie decides it's time to take the healing message to the world. And so he decides to get on a boat and head for America. And so he heads to San Francisco and the uh, San Francisco newspapers have a little article about the Australian healer is coming to Frisco. So he gets off the boat, the reporters are there and the reporters start writing about all the things they heard about the healing minister or the healing evangelist from Australia. But Dowie had a little uniqueness. Now this is not a good doctrine, but it's a historical fact that he believed that unless you were born again, you didn't deserve to be healed. So he wouldn't pray for anybody unless you were saved. And so people begin to come to his hotel room in San Francisco and ask for a prayer of healing for him to heal them. And he would interview each one. And if he didn't think they were saved, he wouldn't pray for them. And Dowie let the newspaper people sit right in the hotel suite with him. So he was not scared to have the press or the doubters or the skeptics or his enemies per se to sit in the same room and watch it because it was God to do the healing. He was just facilitating that through obeying the scriptures. And so finally he found a woman that he believed that was born again and had the right to be healed. And she had a gourd the size of a, a small coconut, they said. And when he discovered that she was saved and felt convicted in his heart that she was, he stood up, walked over and slapped it off her neck and it fell on the floor. And the newspapers people absolutely freaked out and some ran out of the room. They couldn't handle it. That was the first miracle that Dowie did in America. And all of a sudden, because of that, it began to grow and they begin to hold uh, revival meetings or evangelistic meetings where he preached the gospel, asked people to get saved and begin to pray for the sick and his notoriety began to gain in California. Now, another important fact that we must not forget to talk about was at the same time Dowie was in San Francisco, another great general, a woman named Maria Woodworth Eder was over the bay in Oakland, California, having the worst meeting of her life. And he heard about this woman that would pray for the sick and they would get healed. Well, he had never heard of anybody else doing what he was doing, so he goes over to this meeting, meets Maria Woodworth Edder, becomes friends with her for a few weeks, and then turns on her. He turns on her because in her meetings, God would heal people, and people would fall into trances while she was preaching. Well, Dowie didn't handle that. He thought that was terrible. He called the papers in and said, this trance evangelism is of the devil. And the relationship between Mama Edder and Dr. Dowie ended. This was a mistake in Dowie's life. God has different kinds of relationships that we have in our life. And one of them is a divine relationship of a person or persons who have the ability to understand your calling, your anointing, your personality, who and what you are, and able to speak to you correctly and directly about any matters and not be inferior or feel uh, overwhelmed by your personality or your call. They're not yes people. And Mother Edder was senior in the ministry or senior in the spirit than Dowie. And I believe God had arranged these two to meet and the devil arranged for these two to break up. We'll talk a little bit later in life because she was probably the only one that was able to speak to Dowie and say, don't do this or be aware of that. And he would listen. And the devil worked a wedge between them that never was healed. From those meetings in California, he decided the next place he should go was Chicago. At this time, Chicago was the second largest city in America. It's the new uh, bubbling city in the American uh, civilization as it's growing. And the World's Fair is happening in Chicago. And Dowie thought, what better place to talk to the world about divine healing than the World's Fair? So he goes to Chicago and asks to buy a booth or get some space in the, in the fair. And they wouldn't let him. They did not want to have a healing Australian preacher in the fair. But they let D.L. Moody preach every Sunday in the World's Fair, but they wouldn't let the healing evangelist preach. So what he did, he went out right outside the gate of the World's Fair and rented a building called the Little Wooden Hut. 
And he began to hold revival meetings or healing meetings right at the gate of the World's Fair. He said, well, if you won't let me in, I'll stand outside where I can do it. And he became one of the main attractions of the World's Fair, even though he was not permitted in. People got healed and they had all the signs and wonders. And so people came there and they were shocked by what they saw. God spoke to Dowie then to make his headquarters in Chicago in America. And not to go back to Australia and make that his headquarters, but it was to be in Chicago. So he settled in to make that his home base in America of Chicago. And so when the fair was over, he began to build his church. It grew into another mega church. It grew one time up to about eight to 9,000 people. One estimates over 10. And Dowie was bigger than life. Now remember Chicago had two great evangelists in it. The famous D.L. Moody and Dr. Dowie was a spiritual governor or the apostolic gift of that city. And so the people of the town liked him and didn't like him. Now here's what he did. He came to down, built his church, and then he began to build healing homes. Now healing homes, I think he had up to over 13 or 14 uh, estimated that homes that I've read that he had built, which was these large Victorian homes that had like two or three floors and big rooms. And people started coming to him from all over America and all over the world wanting to get healed. Doctors had given up, they were gonna die, they came. And here's what he would tell them. You can come to my healing homes, take a room, but here's the rule. You cannot do what your doctor says. You can't take your medicine. You throw all of that out and you trust God and you do what we tell you to do. And he'd go by and pray for each one. And then he'd have people who he'd train that would read the scriptures to them and minister to them until they got healed or they went home. And so when that began to happen, miracles begin to follow. Controversy begin to follow. The devil is not going to let anybody do anything that is successful, beginning to bring awareness of God's goodness, awareness of God's power, go unchallenged. So if you're in ministry or you're going to help a ministry, you're in a battle. So don't be shocked at what the devil does or how things are reacting. Dowie was arrested a hundred times for practicing medicine without a license in the city of Chicago. Back in those days, if you laid hands on the sick, you had to be a medical doctor trained by a medical uh, school that was recognized by the state or you were in trouble. Well, Dowie said, that's not right. Jesus was not a doctor. He went around praying for the sick and got healed because God empowered him like he empowered me. And so they had his own special paddy wagon uh, outside the church door. When Dowie get through preaching and praying for the sick, he'd put his coat on, walk out the side door, get in the paddy wagon, and they'd go take him downtown to Chicago, put him in jail. He wouldn't pay the fine, which I remember was like two or three dollars. It went up to about ten dollars in the maximum. He wouldn't pay it because he said, I didn't do anything wrong. So finally they went to trial. And so Dowie hired two lawyers, not to represent him, but to inform him about the American law. And he did his own talking and defense in the court. Dowie is the man in American history that changed the law to where all of us can lay hands on the sick today in the name of Jesus and not be in trouble of breaking a law in America. So we all owe a big thank you to Dr. Dowie for standing up and saying, this is not right and had enough faith and guts to stand up against the courts and to win. So Dr. Dowie, thank you for making that great stand in American history. Dr. Dowie, I have found one of uh, a very rare voice recording of him that I want you to listen to now. This is him preaching uh, uh, as a young, I shouldn't say a young man, but him preaching in the time he was in Chicago. Uh, you'll hear it's an old wax recording, so it's kind of scratchy, so the words will be on the screen, but you'll get to hear his personality and his a little bit of roughness and his compassion as he preaches his sermon here. The majority of men are seeking God I am ashamed to say it. The majority of men in Chicago can be smelled several yards off. They think of people being in the alcohol and all kinds of medical must. Oh, Thank you. 
to our nostrils and into our lungs and good women and some clean men at the breeze God is breathing first. Oh, you careful God. You call yourself Christian. Oh, how can a man be a Christian whose house is an open sepulchre and whose stomach is a dirty safety? You dirty dog. You throw nicotine and we form a roses for Alice and Scott and diseases of the stomach and bowel and transmission. You are worse than dogs. I apologize to the dogs, for they are far cleaner and better behaved than many men who are slaves to nicotine in the form of tobacco. Dow has such a phenomenal life and ministry that because of time in today's show, I can't tell you everything. That's why I want you to uh, call the number on the screen and order the book where I tell you a lot more about his life. I tell you about him uh, praying for Abraham Lincoln's niece, Buffalo Bill's family, how he went to Washington and talked to President McKinley and prophesied to him about the need to beef up his security or his life was in danger. And if you know American history, President McKinley was assassinated, but Dow had warned him. Dr. Dowie had a phenomenal ability to succeed at everything that he set his hand to do, but he also had some strange things that happened to him as well. And I want to talk to you because of time about the end of his life. The end of his life was a little more tragic than the excitement of the beginning and the crescendo of his life. Dowie decided that living in Chicago for him was not what he wanted to do. So he went 40 miles north of Chicago and bought 6,600 acres of land and on December 31st, 1899, at New Year's Eve service in his church in Chicago, he dropped the big screen and declared that he was going to build a city that was going to be totally Christian. It, is, it became known as the longest lasting Christian utopia in American history. And he called the city Zion. It still is alive and functioning today as a city in Illinois. And here's what Dowie did. He secured the land. He began to build a city. The city grew to about 20,000 citizens during his life. And so it's not a small little village, it's 20,000 people. It had a, f a fire station, it had public libraries, it had a postal service, it had school systems. Dowie, there was one church and there was one man that was the banker. He was head of everything. And to me, even though that's a phenomena, it was a great mistake. God didn't call us to build little utopias or little places where we get away from the world and we hide and wait for Jesus to come. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our job, to be salt and light in the world, not to hide or be away from it and to say that's wrong and we're going to stay here and live in this little exclusive thing. When Christians go exclusive, they go weird. If we stay in the world, we stay normal, we stay functional, we are salt and light. So Dowie builds this city. In this city, of all these citizens, there came some famous people out of it. Uh, John G. Lake and F.F. F. Bosworth were neighbors in Dowie City. Uh, Gordon Lindsay was born as a baby uh, in uh, Zion City. But over 150 different uh, Pentecostal pioneers was in the city or around Dowie. So Dowie, uh, Dowie's effect on Pentecostalism, especially the healing side of it, is phenomenal. He helped train all of us and to be honest with you, the doctrines he preached on healing, we preach today. He trained 150 people that became pioneers of the Pentecostal movement. So Dowie has an effect on this great Pentecostal movement that we're a part of today, and we owe him thanks. But the reason why you don't know his name, like you would Wigglesworth or Catherine Kuhlman or some of these other great personalities, is because he died thinking he was Elijah. Now, I know that sounds crazy, sounds like how could that happen? But it happened. He uh, got into the place of a mental fixation 
because he saw nobody else that could do what he was doing under the anointing. People around him begin to say, you're special, you're unique, you're one of the end time servants, and they begin to say, you're Elijah. Well, people can say anything. It's what you believe that you've got to make sure you don't let it take root inside of you. Somewhere in Dowie's heart and mind, he began to believe those statements from misguided followers that you're Elijah the Restorer, you're the Elijah, you're Elijah, and he began to believe it and began to announce it. So Dr. Dowie built a city, that was his first mistake, began to believe he was Elijah number two, and then he got into financial difficulties. When you make mistakes, financial troubles come. And so he decided the best way to solve the financial troubles was to build more Zions around the world. He was going to build a Zion plantation in Mexico, one in Jamaica. Now here's another one. He was in negotiations for, with the Turkish government to buy the city of Jerusalem in Israel. And he'd already had an architect to lay out how they're going to rebuild the walls and lay out the city. If you go to the Historical Society in Zion, you can actually still see the plans that Dowie had made to restore the city of Jerusalem. So the man's ego was huge. The man's faith was huge. And he did phenomenal things. But just because you do great things does not mean everything you do is right. Lillian Yeomans became a great Pentecostal preacher. She was a medical doctor that got addicted to morphine after a surgery that was healed in Dowie's ministry. And she made a great statement that I wanted to kind of uh, say to you and use it as a principle for life. You can follow somebody's faith, but you can't always follow the, their doctrines. And she would say of Dowie, follow his faith, but don't follow everything he says because some things he says is not quite right. And I think that's what Brother Hagin used to say is like an old cow, he would eat the hay and spit out the sticks. We as Christians have to learn how to take the good things and release the bad things. And I think Dr. Dowie's life and ministry, every one of us should appreciate, should study. I wish I had more time to tell you about him prophesying radio and television and all the other great miracles that he did. That's why I keep saying, get the book. I spent years researching it. I want you to get it and call the number on your screen or go to my website and pick it up. It's probably in some bookstores as well, but we want you to get it and read about John Alexander Dowie and all the other great generals. And I want you to know that because someone makes a mistake, it does not mean everything about them is wrong. Let's take the good, learn from the bad, and be better ourselves. As we go off the air today, I'm going to let you hear Dr. Dowie sing in one of his church services. And remember, this is from the early 1900s from a wax recording, but I think it's good to hear the man sing and praise God. So here Dr. Dowie is leading worship in his great shallow tabernacle in Zion, Illinois. <laughs> 